13 seasons of professional football can go by in a flash. And I was grateful for every second of it. This game gave me everything. Not without taking a few pieces of me along with it. Playing offensive line has been one of the most rewarding and fulfilling experiences of my life. Not the most celebrated of positions or always the most revered, but it is the pride of the game. You won't find another unique group in all sports that possess the same personalities, perspectives, grit, and humility. Now thanks to Audible, I look forward to sharing insights and stories of our favorite NFL stars with you and, of course, the fraternity of athletes that protect them. Offensive linemen are eternally bonded, and I am proud to forever be a part of the Blocking Brotherhood. I'm Ryan Khalil, and this is Block Forever. Well, I didn't wake up one day and say, you know what? The world needs another sports podcast, especially one about the National Football League. But this opportunity did come up, and I was incredibly excited because I've had this itch forever about wanting to understand the league that I played very long in, that I love very much, and embarrassingly know little about many, many aspects so this show was too good of an opportunity for me to pass up because I guarantee if I have these questions, I know a lot of fans do. My hope is I get to use this show to find answers to all these questions that I've been curious about for so long. We're going to do it now. Playing 13 years in the NFL as an offensive lineman, I don't get very many questions about my specific job from fans, family, or even friends. The most common question I do get asked is, what is it like to play with Cam Newton? I don't know. What, it, what is it like playing with Cam Newton? <laughs> it's like a defensive end who can throw the ball. And I was recently in Buffalo at the Bills camp, and I always knew Josh Allen was big, but seeing that man in person, I mean, he is an imposing figure, and he reminds me a lot of Cam I think the thing with players like Cam Newton or Josh Allen are they give you an extended opportunity that you might not have with another player. So for us with Cam, the intent of the play was always the same, but any time it broke down, he gave us a mulligan. He gave us a way out. And that's incredibly – that's an incredible advantage for an offense. So when I watch Josh, I see a similarity in his ability to extend a play with his feet and also to impose his will on defensive opponents. One of the things I remember with Cam was watching defensive players, especially in the secondary, cower when he came and lowered his shoulder. And you almost look forward to it. It was sort of demoralizing for a defense to watch their own players uh, not want to come and tackle the quarterback who's running through, who's breaking tackles from – you know, linebackers and getting to the secondary and watching these these uh, little babies, as Cam used to call them, try to take them down. And uh, and obviously, Cam was never afraid to verbally assault the other team as well, and and well deserving after he was able to do some of the incredible physical feats he accomplished and self-proclaimed Superman and in, in his uh, celebrating, I think was, uh, was warranted for sure. And now that I'm on the other side of things and I am a fan of the game, a true fan sitting on the couch. My hope is I get to use this show to find answers to all these questions that I've been curious about for so long. It's going to be, it's going to be some growing pains. I've never done this before, but I am really, really excited by the challenges and the opportunity to get to some of these interviews and find out some of these answers. When thinking about players I wanted to interview, one of the first that came to mind was somebody who I always felt like was a very thoughtful person and teammate, somebody who has an incredible work ethic, who cares about the game, exactly how you would want somebody in his position to care about it. He is an animal when he's set loose, 
Love watching him play. Love watching him work. One of my all-time favorite teammates, Christian McCaffrey. Enjoy. Christian J. McCaffrey, running back for the Carolina Panthers, and in my opinion, probably a little biased, one of the most exciting players to watch in all pro football. Christian, do you feel like you have a group of teammates in Carolina that are as close as the guys were when we played together? Wow, that's a... <laughs> yeah, we're going right into it. <laughs> right into it. Um, well, well, hold on. Are you going to give me a real answer, or are you going to give me one that you're worried about your current teammates hearing? I'm not going to answer it as a yes or no. I'm not going to make it that simple. What I will say is this. Coming in as a rookie, now going into my sixth year with guys like you and Olsen and Keekly and everybody on that team, I realize now how lucky I was. I thought that was just how NFL football was. And I've learned over the years that that's, that was a very rare team. And that's definitely a testament to you guys. But, it, you know, coming in as a rookie, going 11 and five, going to the playoffs, that was a special group of guys. And, and I was lucky just to kind of, you know, especially in that first year, be a fly on the wall to all of you guys who had created such a massive bond over the years. And then when, when all you guys left, it was very difficult to try to get that back again. Mentors play a big part in someone's personal and professional journey. Most of the best players in sports speak fondly about parents, coaches, or players that were instrumental to their success. You and your pops both went to Stanford. He played 13 years in the NFL, won three Super Bowls. How much influence did your dad have on your career? How much has an NFL locker room changed? When I came into the league, I definitely had a perspective that was different with my dad. He played 13 years, been around, he played for three teams. He's won Super Bowls and had a lot of success. And uh, he's gone through some adversity playing football as well. And when I was little, he was my hero. You know, I wanted to play football because of him. When I was seven years old, I just wanted to be like him. Growing up in those Bronco locker rooms, you know, I don't I don't really remember the games. I remember, you know, we would play Power Rangers with Shannon Sharp and, and Rod Smith and Terrell Davis and these guys. And uh, me and my brothers would just run around and, and it felt like home. It felt like family. Wait, hold on. What do you mean you played Power Rangers? You know, play Power Rangers, like, you know, when you're a kid and you, what are you talking about? You don't know, you know, Power Rangers is super. No, no, no. I know what Power Rangers are. I mean, what does that have to do with, what, how did you play Power Rangers with Shannon Sharp? I'm just curious. You just kind of like glossed over that really quick. You know, we'd, we'd be running around the locker room. One of the things we just started doing was playing Power Rangers and it just became a thing. Stuff like that, stuff like, you know, going into the equipment room and, and stealing the protein bars and me and my brothers would see how long we could last in the ice tub. Um, I was so fortunate that that I, I grew up around that <clears throat> and got to see, you know, the tail end of my dad's career and watch how he worked and how he operated. And then when he transitioned into being, a you know, more of a dad and, and not a player anymore, he never forced anything on me. You know, I've, I've loved football forever. So passion for the game was never anything that he had to talk to me about or effort or anything like that. We just, you know, I would steal I releases from him, you know, little receiver releases from when I was eight, nine years old. And I remember he would double sided tape my pads. You know, I'm, I'm going with seven year old tackle football, double side tape my pads because he didn't want me to get jersey tackled. You know, me and my brothers, it got to a point where if we got jersey tackled, there was there was a consequence like, you you know, get grounded or something for a week. And so <laughs> he went to the the lows and uh, he'd get the double sided tape tape our pads, put it by the fireplace on the Saturday morning so it stuck a little bit more. All the little NFL tricks and gadgets to make yourself lighter or, or faster or this or that he would do. And so I had an idea of what the NFL was, but there's nothing that you can do other than experience it to really know what it's like. Something I remember playing with you, and there were a couple of players that felt this way, was your hatred for fantasy football. Do you still hate it? Fantasy football is great when you're having success it's fantastic <laughs> you're everyone's best friend right when you're not <laughs> listen i love fantasy football i, I think i think <laughs> i think it bring it does it brings a lot of people into a game that otherwise probably wouldn't watch football did you play fantasy football before you got in the league never no <clears throat> never played I was playing Power Rangers. <laughs> this is what I'll say about fantasy football, though. And this is the only thing other than a couple of death threats that I've gotten when I was injured and having some of the worst days of my life. Um, but I messed up the man's $20 pool. Other than those, 
this is one of the issues that I have about fantasy football is it individualizes a sport that is the biggest team game in the world. And I think football is the most, uh, it's, it's one of the more complex, but like beautiful sports when you understand what's going on and the dynamic of what it takes to make something happen. It's an art form. You're running, you know, load power and the down blocks all are perfect and the puller kicks the guy out and the tight end does his job and it just opens up a crease and you're one-on-one -on -one with the safety and you make, it's like that's, that to me is, is like a culmination of 11 guys who have spent their entire lives working for this moment and it all comes to fruition. And, and it, that's not always the case, right? It's very difficult to do that. And when it does, it's an extremely exciting thing in the same way as, you know, if it's a rainy game, right? And, and you're just pounding the rock and you're trying to, you know, milk the clock a little bit because you don't want the other team to have too much time of possession, but it ends up being a 10-6 game and the defense balls out and they do their job and special teams puts it down in great field position for the whole game. That's a great football game that in the fantasy world is one of the more frustrating things. My only hope is that it doesn't take away how great the team aspect of football is because there's something there that's unique to other sports and, and rare. I love when players on social media pretend they don't read what fans are saying, but we all have. I'm curious what you think about fans having this direct access to you. And honestly, does it ever bother you hearing negative comments from the fans? No, I, I would say um, nowadays the majority of people that I interact with on, from a fan basis bring up fantasy football and how I was either great for them or how they they're like you got to stay healthy this year they, they're not meaning to you know spike my heart rate to 150 they're just <laughs> you know they, they, it's it's part of it you know it makes them feel a part of the game it is what it is but you know I uh no that that honest to god that 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 stuff doesn't get to me it really doesn't get to me at all so my rookie season there was a player that the Panthers extended long term and he got injured. I remember coming in and he was not very warm to me, uh, didn't really give me advice on how to be a pro. And so I had to find it elsewhere and I did. Does that get complicated in your opinion if there's a situation where there's a guy that might take your job? I really do think that it, it's part of the deal. It's, it's part of what you signed up for and I think everybody has an obligation to pass down knowledge, especially where it's needed. You know, I, like, you know, I mentioned how lucky I was to come into the Panthers at the time that I did with, with all of you guys. But I look at a guy like Jonathan Stewart and Fozzie Whitaker, and obviously everyone knows Stu, and Stu had a great career, right? He was 10 years in. He had, you know, done so much. And I think he, he was an amazing mentor. But it's almost easy. It, I don't want to say it's easy for him to be a mentor, but he had accomplished so much in his playing uh, career already that I think he was like, you know what, I'm, I'm, I can be a mentor to this guy. But a guy like Fozzie Whitaker, who was kind of the receiving back at the time and um, a Swiss ar army knife, so to say, uh, for him to treat me the way that he, he did when I first got here was something that I will always be appreciative of because he, he went uh, above and beyond to help me learn that offense. You know, he treated me like, like I was one of them and I just, I'll always be thankful for that. And so nobody wants to see someone get their job taken, but it's part of the job. And, uh, you know, it's, it, it's also, you know, you got to have confidence in yourself. You know, I think it goes two ways too, right? I mean, it, there, there's some, some guys come in and, and they don't want to hear anything from you. And if that's the case, you know, I'm not going to go above and beyond and help someone that doesn't want to be helped. But when you have a receptive rookie or, or second year guy, who's asking questions, who's working their ass off, trying to do the right things, man, they're only going to make your team better. And, and, and a lot of times, you know, those guys end up helping you out <clears throat> in the long run. So <clears throat> I do think it's an obligation um, for, for, for older guys to, to share their knowledge where, where it's needed. I always get asked about which player I enjoy blocking for more. And I think as an offense alignment, the job is the job. But some players give you a bit more confidence when they come into the game. Obviously, you, for me, have always been one of those players. What about for you when you line up behind a certain line group? You mentioned just offensive line in general. Obviously, I'm a fan of offensive line. Most of my friends in the NFL to this day are offensive linemen. But, 
you know, in, in the NFL, the team says this, but no one else around the world says this, but the team goes through the offensive line at the end of the day. And it's a position where your name is only said when you mess up or if you're doing bad, right? Because if, if you guys open up, you know, a massive lane and I run a 60 yard touchdown and I'm untouched, I'm the hero, right? And I love it. You know, it's great. For me, at the end of the day, I, I did my job by running straight, right? And I did just ran straight. But it's to do what you guys have to do, what offensive linemen have to do, and not get the credit for it and, and only get, you know, backlash when you don't do well. That's a difficult position to be in. That's a, that's a, that's a tough job, you know what I mean? When mm-hmm. you only mess up and that's the only time you hear your name. But the offensive line to me is the epitome of what football is in general. It's, It's selflessness. It's, you know, doing your job no matter what. It's, you know, having to do things that you might not want to do in order for someone else to have success. It's a good representation of what, like you said, the the best teams, they have a lot of guys who are willing to do that. You know what I mean? They have a lot of guys. You might not know their names, but they're some of the most important players on, on each team. And it's not always just the stars. And I think that's obviously, from from my perspective, what makes the game so great. I have to say it, and this isn't just a former teammate or good buddy saying it. You are such a dynamic and exciting player to play with, to watch as a teammate, as a fan. But you also play a position that takes a lot of shots. You've had to deal with a few injuries the last couple of years. I know how frustrated you are because I've never met anyone that spends as much time as you do physically strengthening and recovering their body. What's training and mind frame been like for you going into this season? It's a good question. And, and honestly, man, I would love to know, like, if somebody's got an answer of, um, you know, exactly like how to deal with this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it's funny because the first time I, I'd never missed a game in my entire life until obviously the first time I did, I, I had messed my ankle up pretty good uh, against Tampa Bay week two of the 2020 season. You know, it was really tough because it was right after I had just signed a big contract and I remember when I signed that contract, I wanted, you know, mentally, I wanted, I got to prove these guys right, right? It's a new staff. They paid me. I was very appreciative of that. And I needed to prove them right. And so it was, it was heartbreaking. It was the first time I had to miss a game. And I was not prepared for that at all. And I had a lot of long nights, you know, obviously I'm very hard on myself. And there was a lot of guilt involved in that. There was a lot of, uh, shame there I honestly man like I I love playing football and not being able to play football is really tough especially when you've never experienced it before and and your mind is in a place where you can play but you know you're you're hurt and so you can't and so your days are completely different right I was used to coming and showing up and eating and uh, you know going to meetings and going to practice and now it was rehab 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 you don't feel important anymore you know you don't feel like you you are needed and that's a really tough uh pill to swallow i went through a lot of really difficult nights for sure um and days where i was not very consistent in my my thoughts and um you know second guessing myself which is you know, I've learned now is all very natural. But I think the best thing, if I were to redo it, was I just keep going, man. Like, just keep going. Unless you're a player who doesn't give a damn and you come into the season in terrible shape, when you get injured, it's not your fault. But there's this weird thing that happens where you feel internal and external guilt. The external part is subtle. With the fans, not so much. They're either disappointed with you or for you. But with the team... You get these weird energies, but also they have to move on and figure out the hole you left them in. And they do move on. And you start to slowly get pushed to the outskirts. And it's a lonely and humbling real-time experience. It, it is very lonely. And, and, and I think one thing that helped me get past a little bit of those mental blocks were realizing that it's actually not lonely because it's way more common than you think most people who play long enough that some point have, you know, have, have been hurt and had to miss some time. And that, and that's just the reality of the situation. I think when you, once you accept that, it's much easier. Have you ever been on the road with the team when you're either on IR or you're injured and expected to come back in a few weeks? Cause that's a lonely experience too, where you're like kind of part of the team, but you're that's not actually really. one of the lone, I had a, I had a literal lonely experience where, um, this is actually a funny story. 
<laughs> we're playing Green Bay. I'm miserable at this point. I knew I was out for the year in uh, 2021. I was at the point where I was just down. We land on the plane. We landed pretty late. It's dark outside. Uh, we get on the bus. We're going to the hotel. Start dozing off, right? Fall asleep. So I wake up and I'm looking out the window. I'm like, damn, it's a long bus ride, man. Like, I don't remember. Like, I've played in Green Bay before. I don't remember this bus ride being this long. So I'm looking out the window for like 10 minutes. This is no, I'm 10 minutes. I'm looking out the window, right? And I, and, and this is no bullshit. I look out the front window too. I'm like, I, I thought we were the third bus. Like there was buses in front of us. So I'm looking out the front. I'm looking to the left. I'm like, this bus ride's taking forever. So I, I go to tap the guy on the right. I'm like, hey, is this, is it? And I realize, I'm like, holy shit. I'm the only person on this bus. Everybody had gotten off to the hotel and now I'm alone in the back of this bus. They're probably in the team meeting that I'm not in. And, and now I'm in the back of the bus by myself. So I have a panic moment. So I call Mike Anderson. Director of Football Operations, Mike Anderson, yes. I'm like, listen, Mike. We got a problem. I didn't get off the bus. I'm still on this bus. I fell asleep in the back. Nobody got me. I'm on the bus. And he's like, okay, like, where are you? I'm like, I don't know. We're pulling into the bus parking lot where they dock the buses for the night. <laughs> and so I'm like, okay, this, he's like, okay, tell the bus driver, he'll take you back. And then I started thinking, I'm like, this bus driver doesn't think anybody's on the, on the bus. This guy thinks it's just him. Right. So I, <laughs> I didn't know, like, how do I go about this? Is it a tap on the shoulder? Is it like a, maybe throw like a pencil somewhere near him so he doesn't freak out? So I'm like creeping, like trying not to scare the guy, right? We're on the freeway, close to uh, getting off on the exit. So I tap him on the shoulder, I go, sir. And he goes, ah! <laughs> he looks right at me, freaks out, swerves a little. I thought we were gonna crash and uh, I was like, I'm so sorry. Like, I'm so sorry. Like, I, you know, eyes on the road, though. I'm so sorry. Eyes on the road. And he's like, you know, what is it? He's like, I'm so sorry. You scared me. Blah blah blah. And uh, you know, it, it, it ended up being fine. Obviously, he ended up being being an unbelievable guy. We spent a good 30 minute bus ride on the way back, um, hanging out with each other, <laughs> talking to him. Guy's been in Green Bay his entire life. He's a great guy. And so, what was your takeaway from that experience? I think looking back, I don't know if that was God just saying, hey, man, you need a laugh and you need to relax a little bit. And that was uh, that was a good memory for sure. Last thing, quick answer. What's the most important thing you've learned thus far in your NFL career? I'll I'll go back to we played Atlanta. I don't even know if you remember this, Ryan. You might. We're playing Atlanta at Atlanta. And I was a rookie. And, <laughs> you know, obviously I wanted to I wanted to. I wanted the ball and Stu gets hurt. He, he like threw his back out like the morning of the game. And so he couldn't play, like he couldn't run. And I just remember feeling so excited um, because I was like, Oh, this is, this is going to be like when I, you know, I'm, I just, the expectations of what I thought were going to happen didn't end up being the case. And I remember we get into the third quarter and I hadn't touched the ball a lot. And, and Cam Artis Payne had gotten the majority of the, the run carries. And I think I had like caught a couple balls. And I was frustrated and, and I was immature at the time. And you came up to me and said like, hey, like lock, like lock in, something like that, like lock in, whatever. And I was like, I didn't want to hear it, right? Because I was an immature, young, egotistical uh, rookie. And I was so mad. I was so mad. Fourth quarter comes around and I... They throw a swing pass on, out to me. It was either second or third down, but it was a crucial point in the game, and I drop it. And then I started um, feeling sorry for myself and getting pissed off again. I mean, you came up to me, like, you need to change your body language. And, and I was so mad at the time, right? Like, I was so mad because I didn't want to hear it. And once again, like, now, you know, now I look back on that. And I'm like, that was, a, that was something that I didn't want to hear at the time that I really needed to hear. And so I learned a lot in that lesson. One, kill your ego, uh, let go of anything that bad that happens because adversity is inevitable. But also as a leader, sometimes you need to tell people what they need to hear, not what they want to hear. And, uh, 
I don't know. I just, I, I look back to that moment in time a lot because it was an important moment in my career personally, where, uh, you know, as a first round pick and as somebody who worked really hard and I always appreciated that looking back. I don't remember that story. I don't remember telling you that, but I do remember promising your mom that I would keep you in check if I ever saw you pouting or acting a fool. Mom's no best, but yeah, it definitely, it, it had, it had, it did have a big impact on me. You know what I mean? And I, it, even if you don't remember it, I do. And that's, I think that's something too, that's, you know, going back to our conversation about mentorship and I don't know, being selfless enough to teach things to younger guys and, and tell them what they need to hear. It's uh, it's important because it leaves a massive impact on on people. So I'm appreciative for it. That's for sure. I'm excited to talk to my next guest. Obviously, I'm a little biased having played center, but I tend to keep tabs on the guys that play my position. Chargers center Corey Lindsley is one of those guys. He's a true technician on the field, and from what I've heard, a true pro off of it. He's in his second season with Justin Herbert and the Chargers after seven years of snapping to the one and only Aaron Rodgers in Green Bay. So let's get to it. My conversation with all-pro offensive lineman Corey Lindsley. I call the show Block Forever, and it's – both sincere and tongue in cheek sincere in that you know when you are part of this group you always are forever an offensive lineman and only offensive lineman can really understand what that means and then also there's times where it feels like you're blocking forever but so anyways i want to do this show because i really wanted to help change the perception around offensive linemen and culturally i think our position has always been an easy scapegoat for lack of success this is year nine for you. I'm curious if you feel that way now that I've been removed a few years, if you also kind of feel the change culturally, especially as it relates to media and fan point of view. I, I had a great conversation with uh, the O-line coach that was here last year, Frank Smith, who's in Miami now. He's like, when, you know, any other position, a wide receiver, uh, typically on defense a, a lot too, you know, you make a play, you might – miss your objective completely, but you can still make the play. Wide receivers, you know, you make a you make a catch, you drop a ball, obviously they're gonna give you a lot of crap for that. But um in O line it's it's that consistency that, you know, is kind of the hallmark of our game. And one bad play, you're thinking about it the rest of the day, you know. That's a good point. You can almost hide in other positions right. in a way that you can on the offensive line. Right. I mean a defensive guy you cannot make any plays at defensive line all game and have a game winning sack right. and you're you're being right. carried off that field. Yeah, you're heralded in all the media and everybody's talking about you. You're on Sports Center where, And the reverse of that is yeah. you can block everybody perfectly yep. whole game and have a game losing sack yep. and that's you're on Sports Center all day. Like you know, you get your quarterback killed. I mean, it's it's uh it's not a great day. So I think that that's kind of where all of this, you know, comes from is it's our our game is based on consistency and just you know you again you have like a bunch of pancake blocks or you have a, a great you know cleanup block or a great second level block that's awesome you just did your job you know you did it you know you're appreciated amongst other o-linemen but um you're not gonna end up on sports center you know you they might draw a little circle around you and you know say great job but um you know how you're gonna end up in the media is that one bad play and it's gonna be shown over and over again you know so I think that's kind of where all of this manifests is just that the nature of our job is is consistency. And when, you know, when that inconsistency happens, you know, that's where those takes come from. What about analytics, though? How much of that plays into it, you think? Like in terms of? Like I'll say it because I know you can't. But yeah. this, and I never said it when I was playing. But now that I don't play anymore, I'll say it. I hate pro football focus. Yeah. I can't stand pro football focus. Right. And... No, judging by the smirk on your face, I could tell you have similar feelings that yeah. you have to be careful with how you say. But I do think there's also, well, two parts. One, do you feel like you can sort of moneyball football? Do you feel it like analytics are starting to weigh into a lot of how you guys prep and how you guys analyze what is good and what is bad? And also the sort of ancillary, arbitrary grading systems that exist out there and how that affects you guys. Do you feel like that is just something for the fans or do you feel like it's having an effect on how you guys are also internally critiqued and evaluated? I think every O lineman, we all 
complain about Pro Football Focus, right? And they put it out there for the fans and us in the O-line world know what's going on. And, you know, we come in and complain. If you get a good PFF grade, your buddies are busting your balls about that. If you get a bad one, everybody's complaining about it. But, like, in terms of game prep or our, you know, our attack on the game plan, attack on the defense, like all that stuff, it might be in the back of some guys' minds because I definitely went through a phase where, um, you know, you're in, like, you know, coming from Ohio State, it was like, yeah, but I didn't have Twitter at Ohio State. When you get in a pro football, it's like you're you're the only thing on, right? And national news, you know, it's it's the biggest show every Sunday and kind of went through a phase where early on in my career where I was like, I had to check myself where I'm like, I've never cared about what anybody else has thought. Like, why am I putting all this thought into like people tweeting about me or anything and like, like anybody really care, you know, <laughs> which, and I give credit to guys like, you know, the play quarterback position, like Herbert, man, like I, I don't know how those guys deal with all the crap that they get 24 seven. Cause those are the guys that get talked about. You try to shelter yourself away from a lot of the things that you don't want to have a right. negative impact on your game. And I could tell just from being around you and obviously guys that you played with, you know how to weather that in a way that maybe the next guy doesn't. I'm curious how many guys have you played with or play with now that aren't as good at looking at those kinds of takes, whether they be good or bad, and being able to compartmentalize and move on and focus at the task on the task at hand. Yeah. Because I don't think a lot of guys can do that. The little talk that I've had with Young guys, I'm like, dude, I'm not even on Twitter anymore. Like, it is such a toxic environment. My family will send me articles and be like, you did such a great job. I'm like, listen, that doesn't mean anything. Don't send me that. Like, I appreciate it. I appreciate you supporting me. But, like, that's nonsense. In the O-line world, it doesn't mean anything. And here, my first piece of advice is always get off Twitter. Like, if your Uncle Joe came to your family reunion and started spouting off about something, you wouldn't pay him any mind. And so why are you letting that same person on Twitter like get in your head because of the anonymity that comes with the the, the social media world? You're never going to ex- escape the negative news. So you just got to you got to block it out. You block it out. But especially for young guys, it's tough when the media starts coming around and talking yeah. about it. You know, last year, I can remember a play in the Vikings game where uh, I wish I would have, you know, I was sitting on the linebacker too long, and I wish I would have seen the safety. I didn't see him. He was out of the corner of my eye, and I saw him too late, and it gave up a pressure, and then Herbert wasn't able to hit the route. I know what happened, and I know that I'm coming in, and the media is probably going to ask me about that, and I got to take responsibility for it. And so, with young guys, the big thing in our room, we all we have a uh, you know a bus throw. Oh, that's a bus throw. People throwing your boy under the bus, right? And you know that's kind of a no-no in our room. Everybody knows what happened on the field. Like if I don't make a call, I'm the first guy to say it. But if, you know, young guys, it's like if you don't make a call, the onus is on you to take the accountability. You take ownership of it. And then you're able to move past it. Switching analytics to to in-game, play calling, scheme. I played for Coach Ron Rivera, who also played the game and played for arguably one of the best NFL teams in the 85 Bears. Longtime coordinator, an, an amazing coach, one of my favorite coaches of all time. He was always somebody who had a really great feel for the game, but he got criticized for plays that he called that were counter to statistics, especially as it came down to fourth down. And I know um, your coach, Brandon Staley, received a lot of press for this in his first year going forward on fourth down when the numbers said otherwise. And so I'm curious your thoughts on that. For us, it's internally, it's kind of a mindset thing where we feel confident. It's all about, I mean, we, in, when we played the Browns, we had a fourth down, I think it was like fourth and six or something. We were in like a power and, and, and it split. They were in dime and it split because their dime player really wasn't used to taking on the, you know, pulling guard. Mm-hmm. For us, it's like when we see that come to life and coach Staley always talks about like stuff coming to life on film. When you see that, it's kind of like it is a little bit beyond the statistics, right? Where it's <laughs> like, all right, if, if they're in dime, and we find a favorable, you know, formation or whatever. I don't know, you know, you could obviously quantify that, but for us, it's like, 
he's seeing through all that, and we got to trust him. And sometimes and, don't you think there's a feel and flow that the players have that all, a lot of times align with right. what the coach is calling? 100%. And for us, especially when we feel up front, too, when we feel like we have, we're, we're having success, and maybe something doesn't go our way where it's like, you know, third and four, third and three, right. and somebody, you know, like runs the wrong route or like, you know, drops a ball or whatever. And we're like, nah, man, we got this. Like they, they were wide open. It was a mistake. Like let's, let's keep going. And so I feel like we, as an offense, all of us are kind of behind that sort of mindset, that aggressive, you know, risk taking mindset where we're like, if we can get this, you know, like let's keep them on the field. That's one more play. Like that's, they're more tired than we are. Like, Let's go for it. And people can criticize it all they want, but I don't I don't think anybody in this locker room, especially on the offensive side of the ball, is criticizing that. I've heard you say a lot, and I've heard this a lot about you from guys you played with, that you are a pro's pro. I don't think everybody really understands what that means. And I don't even think there's a lot of current players that understand what it means to be a pro just because it's said so often. So when you say that phrase or when you hear that phrase, what, what does that all embody and what does that mean? Yeah, I, I got into the NFL and I was fortunate enough to be in an O-line room where it was a bunch of pros, pros. Josh Sitton, TJ Lane, the two guys that led the room. Brian Balaga was in there for a while. And then Dave Bakhtiari. But our whole O-line room, J.C. Treader was in there, Don Barclay. Josh Walker, Lane Taylor, like we, all these guys, like they really handled their business. Everybody kind of got it from Josh and TJ. Like those dudes are two of the funniest people that I've ever met in my life and hilarious. But they knew when to joke and they knew when to take care of their body. Yes, yeah, City was a, a jokester, but he was in the training room all the time working on his back. Like he knew that to prepare to play for Sunday, he knew exactly what he had to do. And that sort of mindset I was fortunate to come into the league and just be blessed to be in that room. And to me, that's what that's what a pro is pro is like. You can't be serious like a uh, time. You're going to go nuts. Right. This league's right. like stressful enough. Yeah. All the anxiety, all the stress that you get. It, it's tough enough as it is. So for those guys to have that mindset where it's like lock in when you need to lock in, handle your business, handle handle your body right. And I feel like those guys coming into that room. We all had that mindset, and it kind of started with them. I got to ask you about Aaron Rodgers. You're somebody who always got along with him. Can you give us some insight into Aaron the person, and we can talk a little bit about yeah. the player? Yeah, yeah, he's he's awesome. The dude again. I walked into a locker room with like Julius Peppers, Clay Matthews, um, like Hall of Famers, uh, Jordy Nelson, Randall Cobb. These these dudes that were just and, and on offense like Aaron, Jordy, Randall, TJ, Josh, like all these people that were just pros, pros. Aaron in the locker room day to day talking with him, he's a great dude, and he's there's a reason why everybody, all the team, loves him so much and respects him so much up there. That it's definitely there's some there's some different stuff, man. He's he's into some different stuff. He's a little bit, um, you know, off the beaten path, but. Uh, I think that that's a big, that's like a stamp on his character, at least, and how he handles himself in the locker room and how, how great of a teammate he is. The fact that you've never heard anybody that was a dude's dude up there um, say anything bad about it. How different was Aaron in the locker room versus the the media Aaron, the guy who got in front of the mic and yeah. spoke? Yeah, I mean, he's a lot of the time he's he's joking and he's trolling for people sure. And, it always feels like he's playing three dimensional chess yeah, with everybody. He's, he's definitely there's some stuff where I'm like, I'm like, man, he's got to be joking around, you know. Just again, it if if I'm, you know, trying to like analyze him or whatever, or like think about how he's thinking. I half the time I think he's just trolling people. Where it's like, if you're gonna pay him this much mind to this you know, particular area of his life, he's going to make a joke out of it. Does he ever get in philosophical debates with guys in the locker room? Oh, is, yeah. Is he we, one of those teammates? Well, I, I, O-line dinners, you know, he came to damn near every O-line dinner when I was up in Green Bay. And it were always great discussions about, like, whether it was current events or, like, um, topics within the team or whatever. It, it was awesome discussions because you learned a lot from them. The outside perspective, they don't understand. Playing quarterbacks, unbelievably yeah. hard, right? And it's, it's got to be the hardest position in all the sports. I mean, when you think about, like, the physical aspect of it, the, the getting, 
you know, getting smoked by some defensive end, you know, coming off the edge and then having to go right back the next play. You know what I mean? I mean, that's right. tough. And I don't think people understand how, again, there's no way to, like, grasp that, mm-hmm. right? So people got to really understand, you know, they say, gets all his criticism. Aaron's one of the smartest people that I've ever met. And especially, I've seen him go straight down the field on two minute and call every protection, every route to a T. Like, it's just stored up there, right? And he definitely has, like, some alternative thinking, right? It's because he's always questioning things. He's always thinking of new ideas, new things to do, new signals. There's, like, an artistic aspect to all of this. Yeah. For Devontae and him to have that connection for however many years it was, that speaks a lot to Devontae as well, as much as it does Aaron. For him to keep up with him mentally and see the game like he sees it, especially for me as a young guy, it was tough. He got on me for sure. It's because his mind's operating at a pace that's faster than 90% of the people that ever played the game, right? So, you know, he's going to be hard on people. And you can interpret that one of two ways. Like You can interpret him being a jerk, but the right way to interpret it, in my opinion, is is that he's a perfectionist. He's going to demand the same level of attention to detail that he gives to the game. So, yeah, I mean, there's times that he's hard, but I never felt like it was for the wrong reason, you know? Herbert's one of the brightest stars of the league. I'm curious to know your perspective on what makes him great, you know, what kind of leader he is. Justin's awesome. Like, everybody said he's awesome, real humble dude. And you get here, and once you start working with him, you realize, like, this dude's humble, but he's also, like, a quiet assassin. He is ultra competitive. He's as competitive as any person. Like, I've met a few people like him at Ohio State and and different places, and Aaron's like this too, where if something's on the line and you got to have it, like, I'm putting all my money on Aaron. I'm putting all my money on Justin. He has that ability that I think, in just talking with other people, that all the great ones have, where it's like this ability to just put these horse blinders on and when you have to have it like it's this laser focus where they're just on and he's got it incredibly grateful to my two guests christian mccaffrey and Corey lindsley two great football players and class act guys i look forward to speaking with many more of my nfl brothers over the course of the year right here on block forever next week i'll be speaking with head coach of the buffalo bills sean mcdermott and first team all pro guard joel batonio of the cleveland browns make sure to mark your calendars for when batonio's browns host the steelers on thursday night football only on amazon prime video Thanks so much for tuning in to Block Forever, an Audible original. We'll see you next time. This has been an Audible original production of Block Forever, produced by Fresh Produce and Audiorama. Matt Waxman is our lead producer. Sound design and edit by Kenny Holmes. Our producers are Kenny Holmes and Matt Schrader. Production assistant, Ben Gerstel. And our talent booker is Kristen Dunn. For Audible, executive producer, Pat Shaw. For Audiorama, the executive producer, well, that's me, Ryan Khalil. For Fresh Produce Media, executive producers, Colin Moore, Joe Killian, and Jason Ross. Head of production, Elena Bovitz. Our supervising producer is Jamila Zara-Williams. Production coordinator, Henry Koch. And our production manager is Herminio Ochoa. Special thanks to Powerhouse Capital and Mikey Fowler. And I'm your host, Ryan Khalil. Copyright 2022 by Audiorama Inc. Sound recording copyright 2022 by Audible Originals LLC.